It's nice to see some familiar faces and thanks to each of you for coming. First let me say that I am still a rookie to the world of mobility impairments so what I'm sharing is from newly opened eyes. Most of us intuitively learn to walk in the first year and a half of our lives. Incredibly we go from breathing our first breath to being able to coordinate approximately 200 muscles simultaneously in order to stand up and take a step. From that point on we quickly become more agile and as all of us parents know too well, running and climbing come very quickly after. I was no different. My parents told me that my kindergarten teacher told them that I was unable to sit still for more than a couple minutes tops. Since the age of 13, I ran almost every day and since I arrived in New England 30 years ago I also enjoyed overnight weekend hikes in the mountains. Then almost nine years ago I snuck off to do a solo hike to quietly turn 50 and that was where I first noticed an odd sensation in my left hand. While we are developing our walking skills we are also forming words and beginning to tie them together into brief sentences. To create speech without thinking we simultaneously control and coordinate roughly 100 different muscles in our chest, neck, jaw, tongue and lips. At the same time we are able to fluctuate tone, speed and expressions to convey a deeper sense of our communications. As the ability to control and coordinate the mobility muscle slowly diminished, so did the coordination to precisely form words. Long before I started to slur words, I knew the course I was on and visited the Beverly School for the Deaf to learn what children who could not speak might teach me when the time came that I had to learn how to communicate without being about to form sounds into words. That was where I first heard an iPad speak and that would become my voice. I never was a fast typist but it does allow me to express myself. Unlike a normal voice, so far there isn't a way to sound happy, excited, angry, bored or sad. At times it seems to convey the wrong emotion but at least I can communicate. Losing speech has been much more challenging than not being able to walk. But that's for another discussion. Today we'll stick to the mobility impairment. This was the old me. Since coming to New Hampshire to join JSA nearly 30 years ago, I've been focused on planning and designing healthcare settings. For eight of those years I led the healthcare facilities committee down at the BSA. One particular focus was on the special physical and emotional needs unique to mental health settings. I was able to take part in a national research panel and planned projects from coast to coast and even overseas as recently as six years ago where I was invited to be part of a team to plan the first comprehensive psychiatric hospital in the United Arab Emirates. One thing I've always been absolutely passionate about is understanding the perspectives of everyone who is impacted by our buildings. I've spent nights listening to the commotions and cacophony of sounds in an intensive care unit. Nights watching someone going through severe opioid withdrawals. Nights watching third shift nurses doing rounds at acute psych units. I've scrubbed for surgery and tried to watch when my stomach said not to. I even spent time locked in a psychiatric seclusion room where minutes felt like hours. Knowing as much as possible what it felt like to be a sick patient, a stressed out family member or a short-handed caregiver was essential in order to design an appropriate setting that supported their physical and emotional needs equally. Soon I'd be learning a new perspective as someone living every day with disabilities. I took a course in the late 70s called Designing for the Disabled but nothing registered. Then like all designers, I had all these books telling me what to do. They even provide diagrams and layouts, 
So if I turn my brain off and just do as I'm told, I would stay out of trouble. <laughs> that was true for the most part, but I would learn exactly what all of those pages and diagrams and the layouts mean. And I would learn what was commonly overlooked or what simply didn't work very well. But accessibility was still just something on the project checklist for me. When I wasn't working I was running or backpacking or skiing or kayaking or fishing or snowshoeing or enjoying any other activity where I took for granted that hundreds of my muscles were perfectly synchronizing. I shrugged off the first sign that something was wrong, an odd feeling in my left hand. It was a subtle loss of dexterity that I dismissed as maybe a little case of carpal tunnel syndrome from spending too much time on a computer at work. During that birthday hike, I slipped stepping over a wet log on a particularly steep section of a trail and tore up a finger and landed hard on my shoulder. That lingering pain sent me to physical therapy and that is when I mentioned my left hand which sent up a red flag and began a journey to varying specialists. The very first one I saw mentioned the words no one wants to hear, it could be ALS. I found myself first spending time at the Leahy Clinic before graduating to Mass General. Sitting in those ALS clinic waiting rooms I felt fine but was surrounded by people who were struggling to walk and speak. There isn't a single positive test that would tell me yes or no. I gave a lot of blood had a spinal tap and they repeated an unpleasant EMG test so many times that I lost count. Those consisted of sticking a number of needles in my hands, arms, legs and feet and then running shocks of electricity through the muscles to record how much was conducted through the nerves and how they reacted. With each test the progression was recorded. Knowing that when someone was diagnosed with ALS the typical lifespan was two to five years of rapidly declining quality of life. My progression was uncommonly slow but not unprecedented. Stephen Hawking is still alive 40 years after his diagnosis. It would be two years before they officially recorded my diagnosis as primary lateral scoliosis or PLS for sure. PLS wreaks havoc on the neuromuscular system in the form of slowing or blocking the messages sent from the brain to the muscles. I was about to experience some very profound changes to both my body and the life that I had taken for granted. After almost 35 years of obsessive running, that added up to over 75,000 miles in all my training logs, I ran one last marathon 18 months into my progression. I was running with a limp at that time as I coaxed my left leg to keep in with my right one, but was still able to cross the finish line in just under three hours. In a matter of months I couldn't hop over a curb or a rock on a trail and had to begin by transformation. For a period of time I was able to hide my evolving impairments. I went to a speech therapist weekly to practice pronouncing words that I had been able to pronounce clearly since I was a toddler. I was careful to find a place to step off a curb where I could hold on to a street sign or parking meter. When I flew to my daughter's graduation from Jolaine, I tried a cane. It didn't provide any real stability but was useful in warning people in crowded airports and in the French Quarter to give me space, and it got me an escort to the front of the airport security lines. But I still took a couple ungraceful falls on that trip, that's when I knew it was time to try a worker. Of course. Being an architect I couldn't get a run-of-the-mill geriatric model. I found this slick high-tech one from Sweden. I was incredibly self-conscious but if I had been too embarrassed, at least I could be pushing something that looked a little cool. I swallowed my pride the first day I brought it to the office but that was a small price to pay to feel safe again. 
I apologize if I'm stating the obvious to many of you but this was a new world to me. Using a walker opened my eyes to things I hadn't anticipated. We often make single-use restrooms a tad smaller by having the door swing out. <clears throat> Someone using a walker can't move quickly or agile enough to avoid a door that suddenly swings open in their path. We have a back door at our office that has no vision panel. I always braced myself for impact when I reached for the door handle, knowing if someone burst through from the other side, I'd be knocked off of my feet. I discovered just how difficult it is to pull open a heavy door or one with a closer. In my long career, I've never witnessed an architect or a building inspector actually measure the pull force to open a door or time how long a closer takes to close a door. Almost none that I've encountered are adjusted properly. The requirement for interior doors is a maximum of 5 pounds of pull force. Even my office is guilty, of the two interior doors on closers one measured at nearly 20 pounds to open and the other was nearly 30. And the doors should close slowly, at least 5 seconds to close from 90 to 12 degrees. This can be achieved with a simple adjustment of the closer but the pistons leak over time so they need to be readjusted regularly. Most building owners have no maintenance plan in place to keep them compliant. <clears throat> I'm going to keep picking on doors because I found them to be my number one nemesis. The hardware I use to love create a real problem for walkers. Pushing through a doorway is tough enough but when the walker or clothing catch on a piece of hardware the annoyance becomes dangerous. I selected a walker with larger wheels to help on uneven surfaces but still found them catching frequently so I always had to be careful. Whether it's cobblestones, uneven brick sidewalks or even heavily textured carpets. Of course loose throw rugs are always a trip hazard. Anything we can do to make the flooring or pavement smooth and seamless helps a lot. Like uneven surfaces, thresholds and transition strips cause a significant trip hazard. Anything the wheels or legs can get stuck on creates a serious fall hazard. I learned to take it annoyingly slow when encountering these. After about a year and a half more, a walker just wasn't cutting it anymore. The legs would just not move when I needed them to and I found myself constantly getting attacked by the automatic doors because I wasn't getting clear of the closing doors quick enough. I no longer felt safe and secure enough to stay upright. I had to once again swallow my dwindling supply of pride and graduate to next level of mobility in this time a wheelchair. I felt like I was starting all over again. Not having a clue, I mistakenly just picked one online from Amazon. Like when I first used the walker, I instantly felt a sense of relief with the constant fear of falling and gone. But I also instantly discovered my generic wheelchair didn't fit well, was uncomfortable and difficult for me to push. I didn't even know enough to check on insurance coverage or where to seek advice. My brief time in an off-the-shelf wheelchair taught me what not to do. Like any good architect, I started researching all the components and how to fit them to my personalized proportions and needs. My insurance pointed me to a vendor where I met a couple people who were knowledgeable but neither had actually ever used a wheelchair themselves. I carefully wrote the specs around this chair with a custom fitted titanium frame to carbon fiber form back support to an electric power assist below to help with my compromised arm and hand coordination. Like a building, a well-designed chair is tailored to the exact needs of the user, and it's a collection of well-conceived components from a variety of manufacturers who specialize in what they produce. Here are a few of the lessons I learned. 
Some are obvious like stairs and steps but you'd be amazed how often you don't notice where they are when you are able to walk. We step up at a duller way without a thought until we are in a wheelchair of course. Slopes present an equal challenge. It is nearly impossible to travel on a straight line when a sidewalk is canted aggressively to drain. I've encountered sidewalk slopes that were difficult to stop from toppling over. It is not uncommon to find sidewalks that slope all the way to a door. It takes both hands to not roll backwards so unless you have a third arm, it's not possible to open a door and go in. Inadequate clear floor space is always an issue. One example is the 18 inches required on the pull side of a door in a restroom. If we as architects don't plan a spot for a waste can, they usually end up exactly in that spot. Luckily I have long arms but still I've found myself relocating the waste can or relying on someone noticing the door being wrestled with and coming to the rescue. Back to the heavy door and poorly adjusted closer issue, I mentioned a few minutes ago. I instantly discovered it's harder to get as much leverage from a sitting position and many of us in wheelchairs also have compromised arm strength. I used to be reluctant to specify automatic door operators thinking it best to save my clients a little bit of money, especially when they weren't absolutely required to do so. Obviously my perspective has changed. Remember the requirements for adjusting the door closers if they don't have an automatic door opener. If you don't put an automatic door opener or regularly test and adjust the closer, the door is non-compliant. Exterior doors are exempt from those rules but that usually means that someone like me won't be able to open the door. Like with walkers, uneven surfaces are difficult for a wheelchair. On a typical wheelchair, the front wheels are intentionally small to help with turning and navigating tight areas. Because they are small, they get caught easily on bumps or heap cracks in the pavement. I've learned this the hard way when my chair stopped abruptly but I didn't. That trip to get a few stitches was the result of simply not noticing a joint in the sidewalk had heaved during the winter. On multiple occasions I've had well-meaning people grab the handles of my chair to help out and take over pushing oblivious to the broken pavement or potholes in my path. That's when not being able to talk or in some cases yell is sorely missed. Also be aware that padded or highly textured carpet makes rolling much much more difficult. I'm 6 feet 2 inches tall and have long arms but it became instantly apparent how many things are out of reach when sitting in a wheelchair. Our copiers at the office are just barely manageable but only if I lift myself out of my seat and reach as far as I can. When grocery shopping about everything I like is on the top shelf, I tend to rely on good Samaritans or else I'd have to revert to eating Fruit Loops. <laughs> Maybe that isn't necessarily bad. Public restrooms built exactly to the ADA requirements are a stretch and unusable to many. Personally I hate the 34 inch required counter height because it's chin high to many and even I have a hard time reaching the faucet controls without soaking my shirt sleeves. My advice is to locate the sink and controls as far forward as possible. Usually they are pushed back as far as possible to assure the mandatory knee space but that leaves the sink virtually unusable to many. One other point I should mention is for all architects to realize that to move in a wheelchair, it requires both hands. That means when I wash my hands and then discover the electric hand dryers are on an opposite wall I'm left shaking my hands dry because the push rims are slippery with wet hands. I received an alarming phone call just after we completed a large expansion and renovation project for a regional hospital. They said had just received an ADA complaint on the public restroom we had designed. 
This hospital was owned by a large for-profit corporation who had an in-house accessibility officer who had not only reviewed the plans but had inspected the project with me, so I was baffled at what we could have missed. After inspecting everything again, I heard more detail about the complaint. It came from a very small, very frail elderly woman. The bottom line is that the fully compliant restroom didn't address her needs. She couldn't reach the faucet to wash her hands and she wasn't strong enough to open the door. We had maintenance come to adjust the door closer to make the door as easy to open as possible. The point I am making here is that the ADA or any other guide isn't a magic fix that works for everyone. We are all different and have different needs. It might surprise people to know that the grab bar configurations in my bathroom don't look anything like the grab bar configurations in the accessibility books. I located bars and strategic handholds to meet my specific needs. I just added this slide because we encounter these sorts of things every day. There is a terrific Wednesday night summer concert series in the park in Portsmouth but that also happens to be when everyone in my neighborhood puts their garbage and recyclables out for collection. That means the sidewalk is blocked much of the way. This begins to lead into the second part of this talk. What happens when a person becomes disabled? The first thing we often experience is that our independence is lost. If you don't have a disability, think about what that would mean to you. For me, it was the loss of heading out the door on a whim, to explore the wooded trails near my house, or to dash to the store or to drop in on a friend. Many feel a loss of purpose. The work you did all your life can be impossible. The things you enjoyed doing for fun or a memory, and the things you planned to do, and the places you wanted to go, now seem out of reach. This was something I wrestled with for a long time. I loved running meetings and presenting ideas. I also loved running on a competitive level and all these things were stripped away as my condition progressed. Isolation is common. The ability to socialize and be around other people is much more limited. It's incredibly easy to store yourself away and give up since you may no longer be able to visit friends and family or just go out on your own. I can share my story that once I was in a wheelchair, I realized that I couldn't even get in the front door of any of my friends, or a family's homes. That meant no more attending birthday parties, holiday gatherings, or casual dinner parties. In my case that has meant my friends and family feel awkward hosting gatherings that I can't get to. Since accessibility in most private homes is rare, especially around here, that makes accessibility in public places, like restaurants and bars that much more important. For 25 years I enjoyed hanging out in downtown Portsmouth, meeting friends for coffee or a quick lunch and taking out of town guests to my favorite restaurants and then sharing drinks on the waterfront decks. None of that took any thought or planning but I was in for a rude awakening when I ended up in this wheelchair. Last spring when my brother and his wife were visiting from overseas, we spent the day in downtown Portsmouth shopping and simply hanging out. When evening came it turned cold and drizzly, we decided it was time to duck inside for dinner. The first three places we tried had steps at the door that I hadn't noticed before. The next place had a beautiful ramp. But when we got inside we found only high top tables that were chill level from sitting in my wheelchair. Finally we got into the little side dining room at the brewery, by having them open the gift shop to sneak us through. It must have been April, because the Red Sox were on in the bar. 
My brother and I are big Red Sox fans but there are steps that kept me from seeing a TV, so we sat by ourselves in the empty, dimly lit side dining room and tried to hear what was happening on the game. That is when I first thought that someone needed to take the misery out of accessibility in downtown Portsmouth. The idea is simple, just tell people, in very plain English, what they need to know if they are disabled, or with someone who is. Hopefully besides simply helping those of us with mobility impairments, this exercise will open the eyes of the restaurant and bar owners, as well as the general public. And Todd is throwing the ball my direction at this point. Um, let me start by saying I feel like I'm preaching to the choir here. You you will already know an awful lot of this. Um, it's different when you've experienced it. Well, and I haven't. So our teamwork here is, is sort of interesting because Todd, Todd always has to be my fact checker. I'm, I'm always looking for input. But what, um, what really makes Access Portsmouth um, give it a lot of merit is that this is just Todd and I. You go on the website, it kind of looks like we're some big outfit that does things, and it's just the two of us. Um, Todd had the idea. I always jokingly say I have the voice and the mobility, and he has the brains, and it's kind of true. Um, but it cost us almost nothing to put together. I think so far we've spent around twenty dollars on a, on a box of postcards, and other than that. Um, this little, uh, technically it's a blog that was put up at, at no cost and lives inside of our employer, JSA Architects. Uh, it lives, it's tucked inside of their website, so we don't even have website hosting fees because it kind of secretly lives inside of there. Um, at its inception, this was always meant to be a lot more than Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Uh, the concept is a template. Even the, um, the logo itself, we have templated that you could slide a new picture and a new town name in there and replicate this and that's kind of what we hope will happen is that people see this idea see how simple it is and say hey I think we could do that too if you don't know Portsmouth if you've never been there it's a really really charming town it's on the river it's on the Piscataqua River it's very close to the ocean and in the summertime it is packed with tourists there are about 21,000 residents, and when you go to the health department site and look at the restaurant listings and you know they tally up the restaurant seats, in the town of 21,000 people, there are 22,000 restaurant seats. This is a town that is loaded with restaurants. The downtown area itself has 154 bars and restaurants, and it's all historic districts, so it's charming little streets and brick sidewalks and very old buildings, some of which are very tricky to access. Um, in the summertime, uh, those, those 22,000 seats, I swear, are all filled and you're waiting in line for a table. So far, we really are only tackling the historic downtown and the west end of Portsmouth. Uh, uh, full disclosure, a lot of those seats are in the suburbs at you know, Ruby Tuesdays and Chili's and those places, and we're not going to take a look there. They honestly should all pretty well stand alone without our assessments. So um, Todd, being the brains, created a really simple checklist because I'm not the ADA expert, although I'm certainly getting a lot better than I used to be. Um, so we came up with four basic components that you need to have in place if you're going to visit a restaurant or an attraction. You need to know how to get in the door. You need to know how accessible the interior is, the pathways on the interior. You need to know if the restrooms are usable, and you need to know where to park. So we're not the ADA police, although I do carry a measuring tape with me. We're, we're not there looking at compliance. We're simply writing down the way it is so that you know what to expect when you get there. And if you need help with a door or there's a small step, Maybe you can accommodate a small step, maybe you can't. This lets you know what's exactly what's there so you can plan ahead. So we go in, uh, we meet with either the owner or the manager. I, I learned pretty early on you kind of need credentials, so this was our big $20 budget. We printed up a bunch of attractive postcards and this has uh, our contact information on it and what we're doing and the website. So we hand this over to our business owner, 
uh, give a quick overview, take a quick look around. I've learned don't, anything someone tells you, ask to see it because they don't actually know what's in their own restaurant, even when they're standing in their restaurant. They don't understand what, what I'm asking for. So we push the fact with them that this is an economic driver when they go on our site. We already have some anecdotal evidence that people are using our site and when they have family members in town and someone's in a chair, they choose one of the restaurants from our site that has a, a, some, some good attributes to it. Uh, <laughs> we start with the entrance. Pretty basically, are there steps? At the beginning, we weren't going to include restaurants that had steps and you couldn't get in the entry, but we're softening a little bit and a few of these are making it on the site because some of them, although you see steps out front, they might have a secret entrance that we'll tell you about when you get onto the listing. Todd's made me a little smarter. It took me a while to understand that poolside clearance that you need on the doorway. So we will call out, is there poolside clearance? If there's not, you're gonna need a companion to hold the door. But it doesn't mean you won't use that restaurant, it just means you can't do a drop at the curb, you're gonna need a companion there with you. That's the sort of information we're trying to get to people on our site. Um, I do take measurements at the door. Uh, we have a, a really cool little Turkish coffee shop that has a 28 inch wide doorway and everything else is great but they have a 28 inch wide doorway. We put it in the site, if your chair can make it through 28 inches, cool, you're in. If your chair doesn't accommodate that narrow width, then you know that ahead of time and you're not gonna go there. Then we look at the interior travel path and the usability. Rira on the left, that the architect did such a nice job. There's a great entry, there's a vestibule that works, there's ramping, the restrooms are great, and the whole interior is high top tables. So that was one that Todd mentioned, they went in, and if you don't mind having your drink and your dinner up at nose level, it's great, but that's probably not what you're looking for. In that case, we kind of hope that by calling that out on our website, maybe that will make that owner think about it and you know, maybe get out a hacksaw and chop off a couple of those tables and give us some standard height tables that we can use. Uh, gritty little pizza shop in the middle, Joe's, they were astonishingly just fine. And new construction of row 34, and I think you have a row 34 in Boston too. Uh, they did the most gorgeous job, beautiful rampways that, that add a lot to the architecture. Uh, they put tables with hinged leaves on them. They can flip a leaf up and give you a little more access if you need to uh, have more clear access under the table. They were one of our, you know, kind of all-stars making the list, and they're only about two years old of new construction, so that does give them a giant leg up. They're not in a historic building. I think, are you picking up this one? I'm picking up this one. Um, this is about the grab bars. Todd's a little better technically on this. We usually see two grab bars. This is row 34 again, which is, you know, getting our big, if, if we gave out stars, this would be the big star. Um, you're used to seeing the two horizontal grab bars, but the state of New Hampshire actually requires a third one, and you can see it reflected there, the vertical grab bar, and so kudos to them for putting that in there. The, the really terrible one, that's, that's not in Portsmouth. I, I don't know where that is, but <laughs> Todd found that picture and it's pretty unbelievable, really. So we always have to put that in for a laugh. Oh, yes. This is where... I'd like to point out that the architects for row 34 correctly included the 18-inch vertical grab bar by the toilet. New Hampshire requires projects meet the requirements of NC 117.1, which calls for it. For some reason the vertical bar isn't in the ABA architectural guidelines so even where it's required, architects and building inspectors do not seem to realize it should be there. The International Building Code requires ANSI, ICC 117.1 be complied with, and so our firm includes the vertical bar on all projects, simple as a best practice item, no matter if its requirement is questionable. 
I can state with some authority that it's incredibly helpful for anyone with strength or stability limitations. The last thing that we put, we give a little call out to on the, the listing is parking. It's really tricky in the summer in Portsmouth. The town is packed. We've actually got a new parking garage underway, which will help. Um, but we tell you what's the best surface parking lot or parking garage, what's the easiest access for each restaurant that you're visiting. Uh, we also give a link to the city's handicapped parking map so that you can see where the on-street spots are in hopes of helping that. It's, it, as Todd can attest, it's not fun in the summertime if you're looking for a handicapped spot. There's not nearly enough, and that's probably typical of just about any town. Um, we've got music venues in the park that bring in thousands of people and the sites are just snapped up in a heartbeat. So here's what a listing looks like on our website. Now, this is the Portsmouth Brewery. This is where Todd went with his brother and they snuck him in through the side gift shop into a little side dining room that didn't have a view of the TV sets and had private bathrooms, but they actually weren't accessible bathrooms. That's where management thought to put the guy in the wheelchair. When I went in and talked to the manager, actually, there's a whole different story. But they hadn't really thought it through when they had a customer who needed to know how to get in the building. So when I walked through the building with the manager, what we really found is that being snuck in through the gift shop doesn't work because as Todd ended up in this um, dreary, dreary little side dining room that had no accessible bathrooms. In fact, if you wheel the whole way around the building to their uh, back alley, there is an entryway beside the dumpster. And if you come in that back entry, you'll be in the main dining room and have access to the handicapped restrooms. So it's not, a, it's not a beautiful solution, but it's something that you should know if you want to go to the Portsmouth Brewery, it's the best place to get in there. There's also a basement lounge that everyone just loves, but sorry, that's off limits. It's a staircase only, and we tell you that too. So if your friends say, hey, we're all going to the Jimmy LaPanza Lounge, you can pull up our website and say, oh wow, I can't get there. How about we meet upstairs in the regular dining room? Because you can get there. So this is the sort of the simplicity of these listings, just boom, 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 and if we have any comments at the bottom, we'll, we'll call out some little extra thing that, that we've learned as we walk through. Um, the owners are, are very, they're thrilled, really, that we're putting them up on these sites, even the Portsmouth Brewery, who it's not like it's a wonderful listing, but it does explain how to get in the building and, and is an economic driver for them. Now, I said to Todd, if we had a soundtrack, this is where we would cue in that dark and scary music. And then I would say that we have found alternative facts online. <laughs> About halfway through this, I went to the Portsmouth Chamber of Commerce website and there's a restaurant listed. And I thought, oh wow, let's click on that and we'll have some ideas for the restaurants that we've missed. And keep going and adding more and more. And lo and behold, there's a filter on the restaurants called Handicapped Accessibility. And you can click that filter, and now you get a list of all the restaurants in Portsmouth that are handicapped accessible. Oh my god, I thought, I no longer have to go scooting out at two in the afternoon, which is what I do. I talk to restaurants when they're not busy. I try to go in when there's no customers there. Um, I, I, my work is done for me. Here's the list that the chamber has until we start to scroll through the list. And this is truly alternative facts. Um, we took screenshots of two of them to share with you. The library restaurant, it's a wonderful steakhouse in a historic hotel in Portsmouth. It's really a great place to eat. And they call themselves out as handicapped accessible. So of course I thought, obviously it's not the front door, there's the steps, so there must be a little secret entrance like the brewery has that you can scoot in the by the dumpsters and end up in the, straight in the main dining room. But no, it's really complex. There's an alley behind. Go, this is on the phone. We called them up and said, how do we get in if we need to come in, in a, and bring my colleague in a wheelchair? Well, they said, pull up to the unmarked door in the alley. There's no parking there, so you're gonna have to drop them off and go park somewhere else. You can't leave your car idle in the, in the alley. It's only one car width wide. 
um, then call us and we'll come unlock the unmarked door and we'll let your colleague into our back storage room. In the storage room, there's a step up. I'm saying that in all capital letters. There's a step up to get him onto a ramp. The ramp will take him to the kitchen, which is the active, hot, in-use kitchen, and the chefs will all stand aside to make enough aisle space that we can push my colleague through the active kitchen and get him into the dining room, which we didn't really think was actually handicapped accessible. <laughs> I'm not sure that's even legal to wheel someone through a, an active kitchen during dinner hour. So at that point we realized that what um, members of the chamber were doing, they have a, a checklist and you just check the boxes, Italian cuisine, uh, you know, open till midnight, handicapped accessible. No one's looking at it, they're just checking boxes. The next one, actually a, a restaurant we all love to go to, Dos Amigas, $2 burritos on Tuesdays, it's a great place, handicapped access. And on that, I honestly just went to the Google Street View. I said, I don't, I'm sure there's a step. Yeah, there's two steps. So again, we made a phone call. And there was a pause on the other end of the phone. And the, the guy was so nice, but he thought about it. He said, I, I guess I could get you in the kitchen door through the kitchen. No, he said, no, I can't. I, I can't bring you in through the kitchen. There's a step there too. So actually, no, there's nothing. There's no way. We're not handicapped accessible. So we got in touch with the Portsmouth Chamber and said, this is great, we would like to be your experts. Why don't you let us manage your handicapped accessibility on your website and let us be your fact checkers? They thought it was a great idea, but their website's really complicated and they don't know how to update the back end. So what you're seeing on the screen right now is exactly the way it still looks even though in December we said, please add our link to your website and let us help you with this. They would love to let us help, but they can't figure out how. So there continues to be, a, I think, a pretty troubling piece of misinformation on the, uh, on the Portsmouth website. Those examples simply point out to me that a lot of business owners are just clueless about what accessibility means. I'm going off on a tangent here, but one thing I am trying to stress to other architects and interior designers is that accessibility only limits the quality of the designs if you let it. Far too often, designers shut down their creative brains when they are faced with just meeting the mandated accessibility requirements. There is absolutely no reason inclusive designs can't be elegant and appealing to everyone. I love that the Boston Society of Architects now has an accessible design category as a part of their annual design awards program, I'm lobbying New Hampshire to follow their example. Hopefully other states will as well. So our, our real dream for Access Portsmouth is that it's going to grow and be replicated and cover the region, the state, cover New England. Access America, Access Boston has a nice ring to it. You've certainly got enough historic buildings that have to be super tricky here. I mean, we were, it's amazing when you scroll through our website and read the listings, there are a lot of secrets about how to get into buildings, and they're great secrets to know. It would be nice if you didn't need the secret. It would be nice if you could just stroll right in. But when you know that if you're companion can ask the hostess and they'll go get the ramp out of the closet and put it out for you. Well, that's pretty cool to know. And that's the kind of things that we were finding as we talked to business owners. There's more accessibility than you realize if you know about it. There's not much signage to tell you where to go or what to do. So thanks very much and thanks everybody for coming. A stack of cards.